right, this uh, workshop, city workshop, uh, is now in session. Uh, you have before you a copy of the agenda for tonight's, the proposed agenda for tonight's workshop, and I would entertain a motion to adopt. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Uh, hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Everybody's present except for uh, Council Member Willingham, who's going to be running a little bit late getting here. He'll be here for the uh, regular meeting at 7 o'clock. But anyway, we'll turn it over to you now, uh, Dr. Woodruff, and uh, you can lead into the uh, first item. Aaron Council, good evening. We know you're disappointed that tonight on the workshop there isn't anything having to do with your budget for the coming year. After the last five weeks of uh, looking at numbers, I think we would uh, uh, be, re be remiss for not giving you a break, but we're going to show you other numbers. Tonight we have two items we'd like to discuss. The first is the health savings account, which is a potential modification to our current health insurance program. As you're aware, we are self-insured. This will be a, a presentation that will be given to you by Hank, who is one of our uh, specialists who helps us manage our program. The second item tonight is the Office of Livable Neighborhoods. This is a program we'd like to brief you on. Lily Gray will be making that presentation. As we begin the HSA, Hank has a presentation that he will be making, but I want to stress two important facts. Number one, we are self-insured. Number two, no city employee will be required to move to the HSA. They can continue their coverage as they currently have. And as you know, we currently have a plan that has a $1,000 deductible, another plan that's $1,500 deductible, a third plan that is $2,500 deductible. Within each of those plans, the employee has the ability to determine if they would like to cover some of their family members. And there are different premiums for each deductible category, and there are different premiums for each of the selections as far as family coverage. So with that caveat, Hank, please introduce yourself, who you're with. Uh, my name is Hank Estep. I've worked with the city for several years on the health insurance benefit and the other benefits. And um, we handle other municipalities and hospitals in the southeastern part of the state. Um, uh, Dr. Woodruff and staff wanted me to, uh, this year, come up with a health savings account plan to put in for the, uh, for the city employees. Uh, but just to reiterate uh, what Dr. Woodruff said is that the plans that you have in place today due to the management through wellness initiatives and other programs you put in place are not being changed. The health insurance that you have are not being changed in any plan design nor will any payroll costs go up. So the, the national inflation rate for health insurance is running around 8%. So you may able to, because you're self-insured, <coughs> you manage the plan based on your own claims costs. So none of that is being changed. Um, the health savings account that's being offered to the city employees is being done um, not, to, not to really get everybody to leave the, the plan, but the plan, the health savings accounts have proven statistically that there is a fairly large reduction in claims cost because of the dynamics of way you are purchasing health insurance or purchasing health care. And the way that generally works is, is that because you, you have a health savings account, that money that's being in the account, you now begin to use that and purchase health and purchase health care through office visits, drug co-pays, and the dynamics, because, dynamics of that is because you have that money, you begin to control what's in the account and then you start suppressing cost because you're trying to preserve the money you all business owners you may have one of those already in place today so uh, I'm gonna go through this and I'll by all means ask questions uh, as needed um, Blue Cross Blue Shield is the administrator of the plan so the city of Jacksonville uses Blue Cross to process claims. So none of that changes. The three plans that are in place today will remain. You're going to be adding a fourth plan. And it's still the city of Jacksonville's plan. Um, why the city, why an HSA for the city of Jacksonville? Again, what happened is in 2006 or 7, the, the federal government initiated 
the, uh, the beginning of a health savings account. And they said, you can have a health savings account and the insurance companies didn't really know how to adjust or suppress or look at the pricing for that. It took them several years to look at the statistics of how to price or what kind of savings you would see uh, for a, a firm, or, you know, for a company or an entity of your size. And over the past several years, they noticed that by the way the insurance is designed and also the consumption patterns of health of healthcare have been reduced. And in your case, when you look at the consumption patterns, the way what's happening is is the overall if the entire population of the city employee base went to an HSA, you would look at about a 22% claims cost reduction. That's a that's a prediction of what they would, and that's a pretty accurate prediction. But not everybody's going to jump on. In fact, they're probably predicting somewhere 20 to 30 folks may leave the current plans and jump onto the HSA because nothing's changing with the other plans. Does that make sense? So it's a, it's a prediction of about 22% in claims costs. Again, this, the saving is as a result of the way you purchase health care, and it is showing up in that claims reduction. All right, what is an HSA? An HSA is really, there's two things. You have to first purchase a high deductible health, health insurance plan. The plans that are in place today all have co-pays and all the drug, you know, you paid five, ten dollars for twenty dollars for an office visit. All that goes away. You have to buy a high deductible health insurance plan and then you have an account called an HSA. So there's two different things. An account is basically, the account is a health savings account is really nothing but a bank account. But you can, you can set this account up if you have a high deductible health plan. Now this isn't Blue Cross rules, these are IRS rules. It says you have to have this kind of insurance. Now the HSA is a tax preferred account. So the, whatever money is put into that account, it's tax deductible by the employer. It's tax deductible if the employee wants to divert cash into through payroll deduction in the account, that's tax deferred. Um, so that your take home pay, um, your, your net check is actually not being taxed. Withdrawals also, when you use it for health care, are not being taxed. So if you use it for any doctor's office visits, you use it for drugs or lab work or hospitalization, that's not being taxed. So there's no tax consequence putting money in, there's none coming out. If you don't use the money in the account, it rolls over next year and you don't, you don't lose it. In fact, um, you can keep putting money into the account and you can also invest the money in the account just like an IRA. The account, health savings account, literally is, it's a re it can be used as a retirement account. So it, it looks and acts just like an, uh, an IRA. Now, this is, a, this is a graph explanation of how the insurance works for the individual employee at the city of Jacksonville. Forget the account. This is the high deductible plan I was talking about. You have to have this kind of insurance before you set up the health savings account. So Blue Cross would, if you sign up for this, Blue Cross is going to issue a card that just looks like your regular card you have, but it's just going to be a straight deductible. And under, in this case here, this deductible is going to be $2,000. So everything that you do accumulates towards the deductible. So on July 1, you go to an office visit, it's $100. And if, uh, since you have Blue Cross, the $100 office visit will get reduced down to, say, $70, because you get a discount by having a Blue Cross. That $70 then accumulates towards the $2,000 deductible. Now, while you're there, that you're going to get a script. That's what happens. The, the, say the prescription is expensive. Let's say it's $120. Blue Cross takes $120 and reduces it down to uh, $100 because they get the discount. That $100 now goes towards the $2,000. Next week, late, you get an MRI. The MRI is $1,200. Blue Cross discounts it down to $800. $800 goes to deductible. Now, you're having to pay for all this. So it, this works just like your homeowners. After you hit the deductible, the plan pays 90% and you pay 10% and then when you 
when your total out of pockets get up to four thousand dollars, that's between the deductible and ten percent. Then the insurance company pays everything else at one hundred percent. Well, the city does, but that's the way the plan's set up. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, there's one caveat: preventive care. The IRS, the feds didn't want you to go without preventive services. So, all mammograms, PSAs, anything that was just your screenings, colonoscopies. These are screenings that are defined under the ACA. Those are paid for at one hundred percent. So, they, you you don't have to pay for those things. And they want they're not, they're trying to keep you from trying to make sure you're going to get your wellness visit. Does the deductible count on those? Well, the, because that's being paid there's for. There's no deductible on right. those. No. Okay. Right. So it's, it's like your homework. This is pretty simple. It's like what we used to have back in the 70s and 80s, okay? But you have to have this in order to set up the account. Um, just to reiterate, this is the way it works. If you have a claim of $100,000, you pay the first $2,000. After $2,000, you pay 10%. And when your 10% and your deductible equal 4000 then the plan pays everything else at 100%. So forget the health savings account. If if you wanted to have that kind of insurance, you could have that. Now, this is how the health savings account comes in. Again, you've got that kind of insurance policy. So what happens is, is through the health and welfare fund that's been accumulated, that the, the city will put in $1,000 up front into the health savings account. Again, the self savings account is nothing but a bank account and it's a debit card that's already filled with a thousand dollars. When you want to put that in is up to you guys, but assuming let's say you have it right up front July 1st. So what happens is is the account, the health savings account that's going to be set up, again it's a tax advantage savings account. You can only have the high deductible plan in order to get it, but it has triple tax advantage. The contributions are tax deductible so not only the money going in by what the health and welfare plan is putting in, but also if you want a payroll deduct $50 a month, it reduces your paycheck by that much, but you send it right to the health savings account. The money going in there grows tax free and any withdrawals are not taxed if you use it for health care. Um, now the IRS says because you are because you are pre-taxing the money you're taking a tax advantage, they don't want you to just putting all kinds of money into it. They're going to cap it during 2015 at 33.50 and family at 66.50, and that's all sources. So you could payroll deduct whatever that is, you know, up to 33.50 for the individual. But again, the the health and welfare plan, uh, the fund is going to fund up to thousand dollars for each person entering into this July one. Uh, so. In essence, that $2,000 deductible has been reduced to $1,000. Now, again, just to reiterate, the weight, the reason Blue Cross and the insurance companies are saying these are a, that you're seeing a reduction in claims cost is because you now have $1,000 and you may be putting more in there, and you're running around going, "Hey, I'm not going to buy that brand name drug," because on the right now, brand name drug is $60. So once you pay that $60, you're going to really want to go get more. You, you don't care what the price is. And for example, let's say you go to a specialist, you're in there, all your lab work's paid for. You go get $60. The dynamics right now is you pay $60 and a rational person is going to go, hey, I paid my $60. Doc, do whatever you want to do. So you start running up your health care costs. And under here, you've reversed that process. You've said, I got $1,000. And I'm putting in, let's call it another 500 I got $1,500. I'm going to try to preserve that. So the insurance companies have monitored this over the past several years, and they're going, hey, this is actually working. And so you become the consumer, and you try to control that because you don't want to blow the $1,000. And that's generally how it's worked. It took them several years, you know, four or five years to come up to make sure that that's working. Is that a one-time uh, employer contribution or an annual? <laughs> Um, benefits of having an HSA, um, I don't want to leave that screen. If, does that make sense? Okay. Um, the benefits of having an HSA, again, the contributions to the health savings account are pre-taxed and taxable income is reduced. So everybody wins on that from a tax standpoint. And again, the account is there to pay for medical services under the deductible because you've got a high deductible plan, so you've got to have something to pay, how to pay for it. 
the flexibility to choose when you use HSA funds, you do not have to use, if you'll get a, a $30 prescription drug, you don't have to use the card for that. You can pay for it and not, not tap into the account. It's portable. So now when you set up these accounts, these are the employees' accounts. They're not this, that's not the city accounts. So once it hits that, it goes to the employee and it's all theirs. And if they leave the employment, there's money there. Um, those that participate with a flexible spending account, you've got several participants in that. Um, under that, under the flexible spending account scenario, if you don't use it within 12 months, you lose it. So if you pre-tax whatever you're doing, you lose that under the flexible spending account under here, you never lose it. It just keeps rolling forward. And then if you do, I think it's a certain threshold, depending on which financial institutions you use, they will allow you to invest the money. <coughs> What, what are the negatives of it? Um, the negatives from this here, and the, 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 the negatives are mitigated by the amount of money in the account. Um, if, you, if, if, there were no, if there were no funds being put into the account, then what happens is on July 1st, if someone has that plan, all of a sudden they're going, hey, I got a $2,000 deductible and I got to get you know, $400, you know, $400 a month drug then all of a sudden they got to pay for that and if they're on one of these plans they're going to pay 60 and they're done with it so the employee is going to have to sit there and decide what they want to do that's the so, negative so with this plan you have to contribute I, I yeah the, yeah the employer and the employee should contribute something in order to make this palatable okay yeah, let me answer that also a, a little differently as far as what's the negative if you're a healthy person and you are currently in the $2,500 deductible you also currently have a medical card for prescriptions. And so you go to the doctor, you pay a copay of whatever it is, $30. Let me see what it says. Mm -hmm. Under the current plan, you pay a copay to go to just a, uh, you know, Wilmington Healthcare or something, $35. They give you a prescription. You go down to the local pharmacy, you pay $6 for that prescription. Now, that's under the current plan. <coughs> If you go to the HSA, you don't have copays. If you walk into the doctor and the doctor says, as Hank used as an example, well, my normal office visit's $120, but because you're at Blue Cross, we've negotiated this down and it's $100. You're going to pay the $100. You're not gonna pay the $35. The advantage to you is if I'm currently covered in the $2,500 deductible, that $35 copay comes out of my pocket after tax earnings. Right. The $100, if I'm in the HSA, the $100 doesn't come out of my paycheck. It comes out of the $1,000 that the insurance fund has put in. Here's where it could become difficult. Many of you remember a couple years ago I was bitten by a tick. Okay, I'm in the $2,500 deductible. All I paid was $35 a visit and $6 every time I needed drugs. $10. $10. She said my, my <laughs> drugs were more expensive, so it was $10. Whatever the right number is. Remember, Gail doesn't let me do math. Under, if I'm in the HSA, that drug that I paid $10 for, believe me, it was a whole lot more expensive than ten dollars mm -hmm. so I can go through my thousand dollar account very quickly because let's say that prescription for 30 days worth of drugs was four hundred dollars instead of paying ten dollars for it out of my pocket right. it's now going to take four hundred dollars out of my account that's what my concern is is the, the cash flow portion of it for for your employee base are they going to be able to support that upfront cash flow that's needed for those prescriptions up front. And the that's answer one is of the things that I find that's difficult with you know with your employee base is that, that upfront cash flow. Well, ultimately remember, there's a savings but they're gonna need that money up front or remember to be able to do that. They will have that money up front. They will have that money up front because we will begin each year by putting a thousand dollars not out of the general fund, but $1,000 to go in. 
where you have difficulty is if you, pardon the expression, you go through that money very quickly. And that's why we're not changing the current three plans at all. And we're certainly not out there encouraging every employee to change to this. It's something that, you know, we think the first year we may have 10, 15, 20 employees. It's just another it. option. It's just another option. Thank you. Hank, keep going. Uh, no, well, and to add to that, when, when we're doing meetings with the employees, um, the, the number one issue that folks have when they go to this kind of plan is the prescription drugs. Here it is, they, got, they buy this plan, it's July 8th, and they swipe the card and they go, I didn't know that drug, I was, I'm used to paying 35, I didn't know that drug was $290. So if someone wants to talk about it, we'll ask them, you know, we kind of, if, if we know, we just say in general terms, if you were taking, if you were using a lot of prescription drugs, we'd probably wait till next year before you go down that path. Yeah, the, the advantage to the city is the potential savings and remember the potential savings comes because if you're in the HSA and you have that thousand dollars that thousand dollars is your money it's not the city's money it's not the funds money it's your money what we hope will happen is that if it's 10 o'clock at night and you're running a high temperature that you don't go to the emergency room but you wait till the next morning and you go to one of the health clinics. So instead of being charged this, you're gonna be charged this. We hope, and statistically, that's what the industry is finding. By putting people in charge of their own money, money that they can wind up in their pocket if they don't spend it, that you can actually hold down your cost and you will encourage people, if I may use the term, to be better <coughs> consumers of health care. But again, this is not a plan for everybody. It's definitely not a plan for everybody. And we want to stress that's why the current three options are not being touched in any way. Since your since our current plan is self insured and, and this one is is a is is a kind of a hybrid of that. They're actually pulling out of the self insured and going over to this, excuse me. Are there any potential negative impacts to this to the current plan with self-insured if you lose, let's say you lose 25 percent or so? Well, they're, they're still in the plan. They're still, they're still in our self-insured plan. They're still in the self-insured plan. They just have different payment thresholds on their. Uh, all right. On so their, this is okay. Treatment. So this is not a, in addition to, not a separate. It's actually part of it. Is just another option underneath that self-insured umbrella. It's it's different payment rules. Gotcha. Yeah. That's all it is. Different pain payment for the medical gotcha. care. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. That's a support. Still yeah. a city's point. Gotcha. But what, okay. what you won't wind up with is all the healthy people over here in one plan and all of the non healthy people over here in another plan. It's still one plan. One plan. All of the claims are still in one pool. But what you're trying to do is encourage people to manage their cost. But again, it's not for everyone. Yes, sir. I'm trying to compare this. Uh, my wife has a flexible spending account, which that has tax advantages, right? Mm -hmm. But that, her contribution to that, it's what you mentioned, it has a 12 month time, time limit on, doesn't it? It's months. got the same tax advantages as right. this. It's got the, the flex is, is, is really, it's got some negatives. One, if you do not, yeah, if you don't spend, if you, let's say I want to deduct $1,000 out of my account every year. If you haven't spent it by December 31st or whatever date, you lose that money, it goes back to the employee. Okay. And, and we do have a number of employees who have those accounts to cover uh, eye appointments or dental appointments or child care, I believe, isn't child care eligible for that? It's been a number of years since we've had any children in child care. At least that's what Gwen tells me. So, but again, at the end of that year, if you said I'm going to take out $50 a month, halfway through the year you decide you don't want to take it out. Sorry, it has to be taken out. And at the end of the year, if you haven't spent it, it's gone. It goes to the federal government. That is not the way 
this account is set up. So yeah, that's it's it. It basically looks and acts like an IRA, and that's why you would. The, what happened was the insurance companies, when you were small employers that were on the private sector, were getting these fairly over the past four or five years, were getting large reductions in their premium, and it would free up dollars from the employer to put money in the account. If the employee leaves, you says it acts like an IRA. Is it subject to the same withdrawal penalties if based yep. on age? If you pull it out before age 65, you get a 30% penalty, okay? And at age 65, you get taxed at ordinary income at that level. But I also want to make sure that, that we understand this. If an employee has been with us, let's say, for uh, 15 months, and they have chosen the HSA, and the fund has put $1,000 into their account, and they leave us, they take that thousand dollars with them. It is their money. So once you right. make the contribution, it's their money. Period. Regardless yes. of if they quit the next day. Well, and and that's a good point. One of the rules that we will have to put in to administer this will be at what point does the city actually put the thousand dollars in? The law does not require you to put the thousand dollars in the very first day. What we may do, and this is May because we're going to have to work through these rules, we may say that no employee who is still on probation will have any money put in the HSA account until they finish probation. Because obviously, you want to hire an employee, even though technically 90 days after employment they can qualify to be on your health insurance <coughs> program, you don't want to find you know, 120 days into their probation that you're terminating them and they walk out with $1,000. You can't so, put it in monthly? Well, I'll let you answer that. Can you put it in um, monthly? Be because these are really fluid, you, you're allowed to put this in. The employer is allowed to make these deposits, um, spread it out however they want to spread it out. You could do it monthly, three times a year. Um, because you're beginning this the very first time and because of the you 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 kind of, you don't want to you don't want to put a bad taste in an employee's mouth. You kind of want to kickstart it. You may not want to put the whole thousand in there. You may want to put something in there so they walk out you know July first with something in the account, which you can spread it out however you want. I mean it, because it's it's your it's, it's the health and welfare fund that's feeding this, so you can spread that out. And conversely, the employee can deduct out of out of their paycheck whatever you know however they want whatever they want to do, and they can change that. They're allowed to change at any time to contingent on how often you want them to do that. You don't want to come there every other day changing it, but they can change it. Mr. Thomas, you always do a good job of analyzing finances. I'm, I'm trying to figure out who is it good for. Is it if you don't ever go to the doctor, is it better for you, or is it somebody that just doesn't? They know, like I take blood pressure and cholesterol. Is that? Probably knocks me out of the game, I guess. With it Tip, yeah, typically, yeah. It's, uh, that's good. What we found is that clearly the ones that initially that don't really use it, they're going, hey, I got a thousand dollars and all their wellness checkups. So that at the end of the year, they got a thousand dollars in there, and yeah, that's what you want to encourage that. It it clearly helps them. The other folks that really helps because the plan, because the way the plan is set up, are those that have a catastrophic illness because the out of pocket maximums are. Or, or more or less, less than the other. So you either want to be really sick or really healthy. So it's extreme. <laughs> it's extreme. Yeah, and that's the way it is initially, but then over time, what happens is what we've noticed, especially in the private sector, the small employers, they're getting hit with large, it can be get hit with large increases, and the insurance companies are offering these plans at fairly large reduction, and you may have seen that, it's fairly large reduction in premium, so all of a sudden they free up, the, they free up these dollars and they put everybody on the plan. And you find that the ones that never really use it, they're going, hey, this is great. And then the ones that really use it go, yeah, this is, this works. That's what's, the, what's the parameters on the employee's contribution? Up to $3,300. Okay, okay, I remember. Okay. Yeah, it's 30, yeah, that's 33. Okay, I remember. Yeah. Okay. In 66. Now, the other thing I want you to think about is this. And I, want, I, I know you recognize this, but I want to, to remind you. Hank is not selling anything here. Hank is our professional consultant. Whether we do this or whether we don't, you know, Hank gets paid the exact same thing. He's not here selling us a product. What he is doing, though, 
is over the last several years, you have asked us to work to try to reduce our health insurance because we know that that is nationwide. It is just, you know, <laughs> it's a challenge financially. Under Kimberly's leadership and others in the department uh, heads, we've done a very good job of stressing wellness. And because of that, you have seen that each year we have been able to hold the premiums. This is the third year in a row that we have not passed the premiums on to the employees. That's because the employees understand wellness is essential. Wellness is not going to get us where, we're going to, where we need to go, though. We are going to need to look at innovative ways. Whether the HSA is the best innovative way, I don't know. What I can tell you, though, is that health insurance premiums are something we have to find a way or health of our workforce is something we have to find a way to encourage and maybe this will help us in some fashion i would also say to you as your manager i'd be opposed to this if we were eliminating any of your current plans but because we're not eliminating the plans and because we're keeping even with this fourth plan everybody in the same pool I really don't believe that you're going to see a huge migration from any of your current three plans, especially if you take medication on a regular basis. And one of the charts that we are preparing when we meet with the employees will be to say, if you take any of these drugs, here's what you're currently paying for it, and under the HSA, this is what you will be paying for it. We're going to have to try to have as much education, as much information for the employee. Because what we don't want the employee to do is jump to the HSA, go down to the pharmacy, like Hank said, and say, well, I'm ready for my blood pressure medicine. Oh, what do you mean it's not $10? <laughs> you know. Is there so, a cost? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jerry. So we're hoping, if we adopt this, that we're going to be in that industry average of 22% savings. Hopefully, uh, if we're not locked into this plan for any definite time period, we can opt out, opt out any particular year or what? Yeah, you can opt out. Yeah, all yes, you can opt out because if you're a self-funded plan, you could modify the plan however you want. You're able, you're able to do that. Okay. Is there yeah. any costs associated with adding this? With adding this, no. There, there, there's no administrative costs. They're just it's the it's insurance companies are predicting a fairly. Well, across the 22 percent savings i mean what kind of participation has, has there got to be well the 22 percent was saying if you if you reduced if you completely abolished all the plans and you converted over to that it would save they're predicting a 22 percent reduction so it'd be, it'd be yeah and you know just that's so that's not the right that's time. not yeah you know you're i want to make sure that uh mr bittner's question uh if at the end of a year we decide that this isn't working and we're seeing negative consequences we simply change the plan by eliminating that that's no different than if we were sitting here facing a major premium increase this year and we came back to you and said you know this thousand dollar deductible it just isn't working what we're going to change what would be the barometers that it's not working give me some examples well, low enrollment, well uh, low enrollment would be one or that we're finding uh, that the claims aren't working out or the employees are just really dissatisfied with it. Because remember, once you get into this plan, you cannot change it until the next enrollment period. And that's only once a year. So, I mean, it's just like tonight, I'm Gwen and I are currently in the $2,500 deductible. There will come an open enrollment period when, Kimberly? July 1st. July 1st. And we could go to either the $1,000, $1,500 doctor, dollar or to the HSA but during the year you can't jump from one plan to the other John I think uh, Hank needs to get the next slide because it says folks who are not eligible for the HSA or Medicare age or other medical plans which we do have a lot of uh, the uh, TRICARE plans so there's a lot of folks in, or there's some folks anyway that would not be eligible correct yeah correct um, mm -hmm. important points about the health savings account is to be eligible You've got to be, you have to be participating in the high deductible plan, which is obvious. But uh, if you are covered by any other insurance, 
that has first you cannot participate in the HSA you can't set up the account so if you got TRICARE Medicare or anything like that you, the employee can't set up the account okay so that's keep that in mind so that's, that's the other reason we wouldn't want to wipe out the other plans again eligible medical expenses I've hit that it's basically it's section 213d of the IRS code which is the same thing as your flexible spending account and portability we, we've talked about that as well but to, to go back to the question is you know can are you locked in No, you're not locked in you can change this again next year the migration from private sector public sector to these is all in this direction and going towards the HSA I've had a couple clients go back but that's just because they're fully insured and some insurance company bought their business that thing but generally speaking that's going in that direction keep in mind these plans the dynamics are to control those, those small dollar that small dollar coverage the consumption piece of it this is not going to do anything to stop heart attacks cancers your wellness program does that so if we come back next year and say hey the HSA has got a higher claims cost it may be because you had two three folks with heart attacks in there and the, the claims are going through the roof and there's nothing an account will do to slow that down uh, I believe uh, again these are payroll rates these payroll rates will match the current lowest plan option that's true uh, five months that uh, yes sir 26 times a year yeah so this this is what the current three plans you have in place this these rates match it's the twenty five the twenty five hundred dollar so the 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 we didn't really we, the anticipation was to get folks to buy into the plan based on the concept for this year that is the last slide Any other questions I can thank you okay thank you very much thank you Appreciate it. Will it? Will it? come on out. Does this require council action of any it doesn't require council action on the other hand uh, we're always interested in your opinion you know the three most commonly told lies are the first one is we value your opinion the second one is from the government we're here to fix things and the third one is we're going to lower the tax code so although it doesn't require you to uh, to approve it uh, I would certainly say to you if you have major hesitations we would welcome the opportunity to to not move forward or move forward. I don't see any negative impact I think the most important thing is we just need to monitor it let's try it Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your time. Okay. The second thing we'd like to discuss with you this evening is something we would like to create called the Office of Livable Neighborhoods. And Lily is going to give you a presentation. And as always, uh, I will give it. So, <laughs> please. Good evening. Um, the Office of Livable Neighborhoods is a new initiative that we would like to present to you tonight. As you know, back in December of 2014, we had our advisory board summit and feedback received from that summit indicated that we needed to address our older neighborhoods. So out of that discussion, um, staff has been working on a way to accomplish that, those priorities. And we wanted to create this program and design it in such a way that it fosters livable neighborhoods. Um, it would be focused on improving our residential areas. And we also want to have a community engagement um, component of it. How can the, the residents themselves be, themselves be more involved with making sure that their neighborhoods are livable? Uh, one of the things that we would like to kind of promote it as is livable, lovable Jacksonville. That's what we want to have, attractive, vibrant, economically sustainable neighborhoods. This is not a new department, it's not a new division, but it's a collaboration among existing departments and the Office of Livable Neighborhoods will serve as the hub of information coming in and out of the city where the citizens are providing us input and we're researching and providing responses and communicating back after consulting with the different divisions. As I mentioned, it is a strong community engagement um, initiative. We will register our neighborhoods, meet with individual neighborhoods, help them organize to become better stewards of the resources they have within their neighborhood. We will hold quarterly meetings with them as individual neighborhoods. And then there's also a concept where we would um, come together as a citywide 
neighborhood initiative and have round table discussions. We will take this into the community, hold, them, hold our meetings in community based locations such as churches, recreation centers, our youth council. We want to take City Hall into the community. Again, this is very, very heavy on citizen participation. They will help us um, provide assessments of their neighborhood. Tell us what you would like, what you see as concerns and how can we work together to help. For example, our housing conditions, our street conditions. We know that we have streets that, can, um, that need improvement. We know we've been working um, to uh, eliminate slum and blight th through our demolition and clearance program. We know that we have code violations. But another area that we would like to focus on are programmatic needs, such as after school care, um, job training, uh, programs through different nonprofits and resources that we can bring together to, to leverage to meet the needs of the community. We will work with these neighborhood groups to actually identify priorities so it's not the city telling the neighborhood what needs to be done but working together to figure out where we should invest our resources. The neighborhood improvement process, once we gather all of this information, we will uh, develop cost estimates, we will categorize things in terms of short-term, long-term needs. How can we meet needs that are low-hanging fruit, so to speak, immediate things that we can do? And then we know there'll be some harder challenges that we'll have to overcome. We know that we have public resources already within the city that we can target to these neighborhoods to the extent that they may, we may find activities eligible for our CDBG funds, we will invest those. We know that within our existing departments, there are um, funds within operating budgets. And for the longer term needs, we can advocate for things to be included in the capital improvement program. Privately, we want to also engage the community to figure out what they can do. Neighborhood cleanups or resources, uh, manual labor that they can do, hold in community engagement activities, community gardens. Uh, we will also bring in our nonprofit organizations that have uh, community resources to bear. And then to the extent that we can um, research and apply for grants, we'll go outside the city for those larger pots of funding. Our current programs that will shift and work more collaborative, collaboratively with Office of Livable Neighborhoods will be our Citizens Academy. We know that that's been successful in engaging communities. We'll even encourage even more residents to take part. Our nonprofit funding will be um, a component of this because that's a resource where we can give priority consideration to, to nonprofit organizations that will direct resources to our neighborhoods. And again, we always want to engage our youth council through um, the Harmony program and the youth council activities. And we also know that we have advisory boards that are kind of doing similar work. Community Development Advisory Committee is already focused on neighborhood revitalization efforts. And then we want to have beautiful communities, which is a focus of environmental um, environmental appearance. So those two um, boards could possibly merge and work together and leverage even greater uh, knowledge base there. Organ there will be some changes organizationally. Right now, uh, the Community Development Division reports to the Development Services Director. This is a new concept where we will work as a team. So the Livable Neighborhoods um, Unit will work with community programs, which is Glenn Hargett, Development Services, which is Reginald Goodson, and all of us will be working, uh, communicating up and down between the city manager's office. So we want this uh, program to have the influence of the city manager's office to be uh, viewed as something that the city is behind, and internally our departments will be also encouraged to be behind it. And then I would be responsible for uh, working with Carmel and would be her direct supervisor in this shift in the organization. Again, some of the departments that we would invite to the table to help us um, reach the community, code enforcement, obviously, our planning department, public safety. And there may be times when all of these staff members are at the table because the community may need all of that. There may be times where it's just a street itch issue. So we may work with Johnny or Fred on figuring out how to solve that problem or a drainage itch issue. So as we conduct the needs assessment, we'll determine who should be at the table addressing a particular neighborhood need. Implementation-wise, um, we will meet with the core team members from each of the departments to launch and educate them on the vision. We will finalize the program design and prepare our marketing material. We would ask City Council to host the Liv Livable Neighborhoods Workshop in September. As we get through the summer months, we want to be ready to roll this out and have an official launch and meet with our neighborhoods in October of 2015. So that's a brief overview of what we would like to accomplish, and we appreciate any feedback that you might have. Yes, do you have any feedback on this? I think it's a great initiative, and I think it's overdue. One of the things that I do want to ask is, 
I hope that we take a stronger uh, look at code enforcement, uh, particularly on substandard housing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we do have uh, quite a, a, a big ability to utilize some of those, some of that enforcement. And but I know in the past that we don't, we don't do a lot of it. In, in some areas, it's really needed. And we also have to utilize the state's uh, available resources for moving people that are living in substandard mm -hmm. housing. There's assistance available in many of the different areas, um, whether it's their current conditions, you know, whether it's moving assistance, current conditions assistance. We just have to really take a stronger approach in that area. And I hope I hope that we do that as part of this process because there is a lot of homes that people are living in right. that are below substandard yes. and they should not be allowed to be standing up. Yeah. Somebody should be responsible for either rehabbing it or tearing it down. Yes, sir. We hear you. And that's part of the discussion that we'll have as we get deeper in these neighborhoods to figure out what's going on and how we can best serve. Yes. The other thing I'd like to go ahead, sir. I think the idea is a great concept. I'm wary of creating expectations that may be false from the standpoint of being able to implement some of the some of the needs that people may bring up. Mm -hmm. I mean we ought to be prepared if we're going to do this to be able to back it up with whatever resources and money if necessary. But well, we agree with you 100 percent and that's why it's going to be from the very beginning that the neighborhoods understand that we're not there to cure all of their ills. We are there, though, to help them work together to figure out how we can keep their neighborhoods very stable and strong. And I'll give you an example. In the Bayshore area, within the last couple of months, I have met with residents who want to know why they don't have sidewalks. And I said, well, you know, we do have a sidewalk program. Uh, are you willing to give us six feet of your property behind the curb line in order for us to put in the sidewalks? Well, no, I, I'm not willing to do that. And that's the type of discussions that we're going to have to have. What we can't do is go out there and, and basically be the, uh, you know, the person with the organ grinder just trying to make everybody happy right. and think. On the other hand, by organizing neighborhoods, and helping them work together on everything from cleaning up to whatever it may be. And this is going to be a whole lot more than just a cleanup effort. Mm -hmm. I mean, it will have to be a full court press on things such as, you know, litter, such as vacant and dilapidated houses, uh, crime in the area. We're not taking this from the standpoint that the police department, uh, you know, they're their community policing is important and it's doing a good job. But you should never reach out to your neighborhood through the police department. You need to reach out, and Mayor, I know you'll agree with this, you need to reach out as a government. The police department is a component of it. And if they decide they want a neighborhood watch, that's fine. But the neighborhood watch should not be the door that they reach all city services through. I think the main thing is you have to engage the neighborhood to be involved, okay? To be involved in the process itself. Not go in and tell them what you're going to do, but, you know, get the ideas, you know, what do they from do? the neighborhood, what they want, and, and see what you can do as far as facilitating movement towards that. Now, I think if that's the, the avenue you're looking at, I think you're on the right track. Well, again, let's just say for discussion purposes that a neighborhood says we want a pool. Well, we're not going to sit there and promise that pool. You know, what we're going to say to them is you have to realize the limited resources that the city has. And therefore, you know, if you want to talk about a community investment in more parks, there's a capital improvement program. We'll be happy to present these ideas for council. And it may be five to ten years before you see that idea become reality. On the other hand, I also want to stress we are doing this within the current resources and staffing. We're not hiring anyone new. We purposely did not create a department for this. And here's the reason why. This needs to be the responsibility of every department. We don't want it where somebody says, oh, that's their responsibility. 
we want to create the environment which y'all have done a good job of leading and that is every city employee is responsible for every problem in the city that's why this is a collaborative effort of every department Lily will be leading that effort I can't help but think about what was it the story in New York about the broken window and mm -hmm. deteriorated housing unless the law is changing John can bring us up to date on this is that I think one of the most frustrating things for a city official is for someone to point out a house that might be vacant start to be run down and try to explain to the neighborhood why things can't happen why it can't be repaired just like that or why or the legal process involved in demolition mm -hmm. uh, we don't have such a thing as a well, I guess we do a minimum do. housing code, but it's but it's rather it's minimum. It's a minimum housing. Oh yeah, yeah, I guess that's the best word. It's minimal. It doesn't really address some of the problems that the neighborhood would see. But and I'll give you an example on that. Uh, a lot of homes today that have vinyl siding. After the winter, you will see a lot of uh, you know green uh, growing on it. The type of things we hope to accomplish here would be, okay, we've got a whole lot of houses in that neighborhood who need to be pressure washed, mm -hmm. and we can use CDBG money to rent a pressure washer, and we can train the people in the neighborhood to actually come and check it out and to pressure wash their house. I mean, that's, that's the concept of trying to find common problems that can be solved by common efforts. This is not, and I want to stress this, this is not the government coming to solve all your problems. This is an effort for us to try to find a collaborative way to help neighborhoods solve their problems with some assistance from the city. Not doing like the federal government, just throwing money at it, right? Hoping it'll go away. Well, and through the reduction of the CDBG funds and that program dwindling, I think it's a good move and trying to figure out, okay, you know, we still have the same issues that we had when we had the funding, so how do we, how do we regroup and, and, and get better results with what we have? And I think it's a, it's a good step forward because a community together can make a lot of changes as long as they understand what the playing field is and what part we play, what part they play, what assistance is out there, what resources we have, and collectively you can have a better neighborhood for addressing some issues. Uh, Reggie, uh, would you mind coming up to the table, please? Okay. Now, obviously, uh, this is going to be, and Glenn, if you'd like to step in, too, because, you know, Reggie and Glenn are going to play an important part because we're, uh, you know, consolidating resources. Uh, Reggie, you have comments or thoughts? Uh, no, sorry, I came in at the end, but I, I know a lot of conversation about CDBG money, but this is more than just CDBG. Um, we talk, like Richard said, citywide, every department. We may go into a neighborhood, might be issues with potholes, could be drainage, could be infrastructure, could be a lot of things. So it's more than just CDBG. Maybe some things that will be required to be fixed with with other funds, not, not just CDPG funds. Um, when I worked with Durham, I was associate director over housing. We had three folks that were liaisons and they went out to the community and told them about the, the services and programs we had just in the housing department. But this is gonna be citywide. So our staff will be telling neighborhoods about the services and programs we have citywide. Won't just be housing, won't just be CDPG. So that's the part I want to stress. And about our minimum housing code, it is minimum, but some cities have gone above the minimum and put in provisions such as if a house is boarded up for three years and no improvements, you have to demolish it. We have a minimum code, but we can take it above the minimum if we choose to. So that's, that's up to a city policy if you want to go that far with it. Go ahead. Well, some of you will remember in the past we had some neighborhood <coughs> meetings and uh, some of them were to try to find out what citizens wanted, as Mr. Bittner referred to, and sometimes they were a little bit reactive as it is. Uh, this does give you a chance to go out in front of those things and engage them. 
I think it's a wonderful example of what successes were attributed to the Weed and Seed program, in which we were very forward and in the target areas, and we saw a really demonstrated reduction in crime. We saw some significant community involvement. We saw neighborhoods that wanted to try to help themselves with a little bit of um, effort that was an organizational thing such such there. Um, while this program doesn't have some of the incentives that Weed and Seed has, it has the organizational capacity to do this. And additionally, it has, as has been described, this takes City Hall out of City Hall and takes it to the neighbors that are there. And it lets you have this audacious goal of saying, we want to touch after some reasonable period of time, every neighborhood to let them know that's what's to come out. What's the uh, implementation plan? Obviously, you have to identify <laughs> communities. Mm -hmm. Somehow, you've got to define what yes. what is involved in what what is that mm -hmm. neighborhood. Well, we have already printed us. We have a subdivision map, but even that shows all the subdivisions in the neighborhood. But every street and block is not categorized as a subdivision. So we'll be working to de define some log log logical boundaries for neighborhoods and maybe two neighborhoods working together that probably wouldn't see themselves like the Georgetown, Collin Heights area, maybe two, but it's small enough that it could work together. We know that there's two sides of Northwoods. It depends on the size, the scope, and you know, logical street boundaries that they may come together. So we'll be working on that to come up with some something that makes sense to, as to who to invite to the meeting. And then we will hope that they would organize themselves in such a way. We know that we have formal um, homeowners associations, and I want to be clear, this is not to create HOAs in the legal context, but sh there could be some uh, self-organizing that goes on where they organize, have their own neighborhood presidents and committees, and they begin to take on some of the challenges and address them from within. So hopefully that, that is the goal of what would come out of this, that they they have a voice, we know who to contact, we know who to reach out to, and also I think what we will find is oftentimes we may respond to one person's complaint. You get everybody in the room, you get some synergy, you may find that there's another way to solve problems that we haven't thought about, that this is not the problem of the neighborhood, this is just that one person, it may be that the majority feel the city should be here, so it helps us focus resources better and be more efficient. Well, one of the things, that's why we are going to take the next several months, if y'all are comfortable with the concept, we now need to take the skeleton and put a whole lot of programmatic effort in it. One of our thoughts is to look at the CIP, which you will adopt sometime between now and June the 30th. And let's say for discussion purposes, there is a neighborhood where we know we are going to be uh, having water and sewer line improvements. And that means the road is going to be resurfaced. That may be a good neighborhood for us to go ahead and spend a lot of effort on this coming year because we can actually show the folks we're doing something. What we, what we don't want to do is build false hopes, though. And that's why if in the first year all we have been able to do is reach out and touch three or four of the neighborhoods, it's a start. I worry about expectations. You know, so, some, so many times I think we get a sense that some people want us to do much more than what we're financially able to do. I mean, they want it now, and we can't do it now. This is for information only. Uh, we're not asking you to uh, endorse the overall concept. Uh, we are going to work on it over the next several months. We'll bring more information back to you. Uh, as we are preparing this information, we will keep uh, sending it along and any suggestions that you have. I had a very nice uh, conversation earlier today from a school board member who might just happen to be present sitting behind the mayor, Mr. Williams, and he mentioned that uh, other communities, I believe he said San Francisco, Kansas City, San Diego, sir? That's correct. Uh, among others, and uh, I believe you said Hartford, Connecticut? I believe so. As well. And so we're, we're going to be doing some research on how they have set up similar programs. Well, thank you very much. Mayor, that concludes the items we have for the workshop. We do have a city council meeting at 7 o'clock. Okay. Anybody have anything? How about a motion to motion adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.